So recently on this page, we posted about Hidan, specifically a you know nothing about Hidan. And just like with every time we post about Hidan, the question got posed in the comments, could he have learned the eight gates? And while the question to that is absolutely he could have, the real question that stems out of that is that if he had learned the eight gates, would his immortality save him from the consequences of the eighth gate? And while that is a great question, and one as though I feel as though I'm qualified to answer, going down that line of thought got me thinking about something a lot bigger, a lot cooler, a lot more well-rounded than just this one kind of small question that revolves around a hypothetical around one character. As I was pondering what Hidan with eight gate capabilities would be capable of, I got to thinking, while that may be one of the strongest combinations of two possible abilities in the entirety of Naruto, what are the other ones? What two abilities when used by the same person in Naruto would make the strongest ninjas in the universe? Obviously, I could sit here and say if somebody had a Rini Sharingan and a Byakugan and the Eight Gates and Hundred Healings and Hidan's Immortality, they would be the strongest person alive. God knows there's a million people out there who've made own characters with that exact set of abilities. But that's boring, it's contrived, it's too easy. So I set out to brainstorming simply what two abilities when combined together would make the strongest person in the universe. And as I headed down this path, I realized it was a frustrating one. Not because it was hard to think of these combinations of two abilities, but because the majority of these two ability combinations could have happened, unlike the circumstances of those own characters we talked about earlier. So without further ado, let's get into the two strongest abilities that any character could have in combination in the Naruto universe. That is not a catchy title. Before we get to talking about combinations of abilities, guys, I got a combination I need you to do right now, which is liking this video, subscribing to the page, and hitting that noti bell. And there's actually one more step to that combination, and that's following my other YouTube channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking Naruto, I talk literally any other anime. So while this entire video could just be me telling you that every jutsu goes well with the eight gates, that would be boring. Because as a standalone ability, the eight gates, most specifically the eighth gate, is probably the strongest ability in Naruto. I'm saying standalone ability here. The eighth gate allowed my guy, a person who is nowhere near as strong as Madara, to fight on par with Madara. The singular act of the upgrade of the eighth gate is arguably the strongest move in Naruto. Meaning that by opening the eighth gate, we see the largest improvement in somebody's battle prize out of any ability in Naruto. Therefore, obviously, the 8th gate in any other jutsu would be awesome. I mean, imagine if my guy had Flying Thunder God on top of Night Guy. He wouldn't have had to worry about closing the distance between him and Madara. He could have just teleported behind him and kicked him in the back. However, we are going to talk about the 8 gates for a little bit. More specifically, we should go back to the idea that quite literally started this video. What would happen if Hidan's immortality met? eighth gate. See, this is actually one of my favorite hypotheticals to ponder, and it's actually something I went over rather largely in my video, What If Rock Lee Joins the Akatsuki. See, in this What If I wanted to find a rational way that a user of the eight gates would get immortality. And what's aggravating about this hypothetical is that Rock Lee would probably never be able to get Hidan's immortality for a couple of reasons. One, even if he was going undercover like I had him doing in that What If, he probably wouldn't be able to bring himself to kill enough people to be granted immortality by Lord Joshin. And then there's the other very distinct possibility that Lord Joshin doesn't exist and Hidan just had immortality. Regardless, what we're looking at is that if anybody is going to be getting this combination of two abilities, it's going to be Hidan. And honestly, if Hidan had started in the Hidden Leaf, he probably would have had them. See, a little known fact about Hidan is that he can't use ninjutsu or genjutsu. He, like Mike Guy or Rock Lee, was Taijutsu only. Now, this wasn't a massive problem for him on account of the fact that he was immortal. But the thing is, he wasn't always immortal. At least that's what conventional lore would tell us. So if hypothetically Hidan were to be born into the Hidden Leaf, well, his life could have been very different. Hidan is a little bit younger than Mike Guy and Kakashi, meaning that there's a possibility that if he was born in the Hidden Leaf, he possibly could have trained with Mike Guy as somebody without ninjutsu or genjutsu. I mean, he probably would have trained with Mike Guy, but still. Now, obviously, if Hidan is born into Konoha, there's a solid possibility he doesn't spin out and go join Lord Joshin. But assuming in the scenario that he is actually just born with immortality, like I believe him to be, in this scenario, Hidan would have both the eight gates and immortality. So genuinely, why would that be so powerful? And while the answer may seem relatively obvious, it's actually not as obvious as you might think. So the obvious answer as to why the eighth gates and Hidan's immortality work well together is because Hidan's regenerative abilities would heal him from any injuries incurred by using the eight gates. And for gates one through seven, this is absolutely the case. There is absolutely no reason to believe that any of the injuries Hidan would incur by using even up to the seventh gate 
wouldn't be able to regenerate almost immediately through his regeneration factor. I mean, we've seen Hidan stab himself through the heart, pull out the stake, and be fine. And in the seventh gate, it's not like Mike Guy or Rock Lee were kicking their legs off. Their bones were breaking. That's pretty much it. Bones breaking and muscles tearing is small potatoes to Hidan's healing factor. So just as fast as Hidan would break a bone by launching something like an evening elephant or a morning peacock, and the blast of those airwaves would shatter his bones, they would heal. Which means that effectively, Hidan could exist in the seventh gate much longer than anybody else ever. But not indefinitely. And really, not even that much longer than Mike Guy or Rock Lee. Another common misconception about Rock Lee and Mike Guy is that they don't have chakra. They very much do have chakra. The problem is Rock Lee just can't mold his chakra into ninjutsu or genjutsu. Mike Guy can though. And they have to expend chakra when they use the eight gate. Chakra is as much about physical expenditure as it is about ninjutsu expenditure. Because the majority of high level ninjas are using chakra to super boost their physical strength. So even if Hidan did hypothetically have access to the eight gates, well, he technically wouldn't sustain any injuries from the first to seventh gates. Since his chakra levels aren't that much higher than Mike Guy or Rock Lee's, he wouldn't be able to sustain those gates much longer than either of them. I mean, he'd probably be able to sustain it for a little bit longer because of the durability feat. And he wouldn't be injured after using it, but that's just about it. The real strength for Hidan comes from the 8th gate. See, the way that the 8th gate works is that the user of the 8th gates punctures the Tenketsu point in their heart. My guy has been seen doing this with his thumb. Upon puncturing that Tenkatsu point on the heart, all of the chakra in the body flows to the heart. This is important because as all the chakra flows to the heart, the heart begins to beat at an insane rate. The heart beats so quickly that the person who just opened the eighth gate's blood gets so hot, it evaporates outside of their body. But because their heart is beating so quickly, their strength becomes superhuman. The only problem is once you've started this heartbeat, there's no way to stop it. Your heart continuously beats at such a high level that it quite literally boils your blood and then turns your body into ash. The internal temperature of your body gets so hot after using the eighth gate that you quite literally burn to death from the inside out after activating it. What happens in a body that's able to regenerate infinitely? Nothing good. Actually, it's a nightmare. Imagine this. Think of the time you've been the most wired in your entire life. A time you had three five-hour energies and two double espresso shots because you had to stay up all night to study for an exam you had tomorrow. Now imagine that caffeine never dissipates from your system, but at the same time, you get sleepy. This is essentially exactly what would happen to Hidan if he were to activate the eighth gate. See, while Hidan's regeneration ability is technically infinite, his chakra is not, which means that if Hidan were to activate the eighth gate, he would eventually run out of chakra long before he actually died, which isn't the worst thing, but also is far from the best thing. See, since Hidan can't die, running out of chakra won't kill him. Essentially, one of two things would happen. Either Hidan would enter a coma until he recovered enough chakra to wake up from said coma, or Hidan would continue to exist without chakra. See, this wouldn't be the biggest deal for Hidan. He wouldn't be able to use his chakra to boost his physical feats anymore, but that wouldn't really be a problem because his heart would be beating at 300 beats per minute for the rest of his life. See, Hidan would now just have all the supernatural strength of the eighth gate without the chakra boosted strength aspect of it. And he would just live in a perpetual cycle of his insides burning and his body fixing the burn. Essentially, he would become the main character of Fire Punch. He would be supernaturally strong, but constantly on fire and shattering his bones every time he punched somebody. Because he can't die, and I genuinely believe his regeneration would be able to keep up with the damage incurred by the Eighth Gate, there's really no end in sight for him. The only way that he would be able to possibly break out of the Eighth Gate is if his body completely disintegrated and then he reformed from the disintegration. With the complete destruction of his Tenketsu points and his chakra network, he might be able to get out of the Eighth Gate. But outside of that possibility, this is not a strong combination. It's more a curse than a blessing. The Eighth Gate is painful. Could you imagine your blood being so hot it evaporated out of the pores in your skin? Now that doesn't mean that the Eighth Gate doesn't work with any jutsu. There is one specific jutsu that makes the eighth gate exponentially stronger. And that's a combination we've actually talked about a fair amount on this page. The eight gates plus the hundred healing. I genuinely believe this is the strongest possible combination of jutsus in the entirety of Naruto. I don't care if you have the Rini Sharingan and Flying Thunder God. I'm pretty sure 
this still wins. Also, having the Rini Sharangan and Flying Thunder God is redundancy. Both can teleport. You see, where Hidan's immortality fails, the 100 healings absolutely succeeds when we're talking about in combination with the 8th gate. Much in the same way that Hidan's immortality would be able to heal any incurred damage from the 1st to 7th gate, the 100 healings would be able to deal with those damages no problem whatsoever. Sakura and her light novel, Sakura Hidan, was able to regenerate an arm immediately. Like a full arm. Like she lost an entire arm and she grew a new one. So any broken bones or torn muscles incurred from the 1st to 7th gate would be healed the second they were broken. The real difference between Hidan immortality in the 100 healings here is the eighth gate. The irony here is the 100 heals would allow you to die. You see, since the 100 healing technique is built upon storing a massive amount of chakra in your Byakuya seal and then using that massive amount of chakra to increase the mitotic regeneration of your cells, it ends up working perfectly with how the eighth gate would function. See, the problem with Hidan's immortality is that he has a human amount of chakra, but the 100 healings or the Byakuya seal confers both superhuman chakra and superhuman regeneration. So let's say somebody like Sakura learns the eight gates. If she were to act Activate the eighth gate, she would be able to use the eighth gate 100 times longer than Might Guy. Because with the activation of the 100 heals, she has 100 times the chakra and 100 times to die, meaning that she could burn her body to a crisp 100 times and bring it back each time. On top of that, a major problem with Mike Guy fighting in his 8th gate form is that he was breaking his legs every time he landed a kick. And while they would still very much die at the end, anybody that they were fighting would also still be very much dead. Imagine for a second that Mike Guy had 99 more attempts to kill Madara. He would have had time for Kaguya and Black Zetsu and maybe throw Obito in there as well. And what's really aggravating about that combination is that Sakura should have ended up with Rock Lee. He was nice to her. He cared about her. She brought him flowers in the hospital. Sasuke is a dirtbag. And well, yes, I adore Sarada Uchiha. She's one of my favorite characters in Boruto. Imagine if Rock Lee and Sakura had a child that was their ability. Would have been helpful considering the fact that every single Otsutsuki is able to nullify, oh, I don't know, all Genjutsu and Ninjutsu. Seems about time we start reinvesting in these bad boys. But enough about the eight gates. I literally opened this video saying I wasn't going to make a long list of things to add to the eighth gate. So in our first entry that has nothing to do with the eighth gate, let's talk about Flying Thunder God, also known as Flying Raijin. Now, Flying Raijin is unequivocally one of the strongest abilities in Naruto. It grants the user the ability to teleport anywhere that they have a mark instantaneously. And these marks can be placed on people. So should hypothetically somebody like Minato place a mark on you, he can teleport to you whenever. Have fun never sleeping again. How can you make Flying Thunder God better? Well, there's a lot of things you could add to it. Basically, anything added to Flying Thunder God makes it better. But honestly, I would say the best thing that you could add to Flying Thunder God would simply just be the Sharingan. What about the Sharingan, you ask? Everything. Literally add any Sharingan ability to Flying Thunder God when you have the most broken character in the entirety of Naruto's history. Even just the extrasensory perception that a Sharingan confers to a Sharingan user makes Flying Thunder God that much scarier. Now, not only are you able to teleport anywhere you need to instantaneously, you now have better reaction time. You can track people's chakra. You can sort of see through objects. If you make eye contact with somebody trying to run away from a man who has irrelevant speed, you can put them in Genjutsu. Not to mention all the abilities of the Sharingan. Flying Thunder God plus Amaterasu. I'm in front of you, you're on fire. Flying Thunder God plus Tsukiyomi. You're not looking at me because you don't want to be caught in my Genjutsu. Whoops, now I'm over there. Have fun getting stabbed for 72 hours. Flying Thunder God plus Kamui. If you can somehow keep up with me instantaneously traveling to all these marked points and somehow land a blow on me, you're just not going to because it'll go through me. Not to mention I could just teleport behind you and then Kamui you into the Kamui dimension and then... Well, that's it. And don't even get me started on Susano. You thought the idea of Minato showing up in the middle of the night with a kunai to your throat is scary. Imagine if he was the size of a mountain. And here's the thing, while technically mass does kind of matter when we're talking about flying Raijin, Minato was able to teleport a tailed beast bomb away from Konoha. And tailed beast bomb are made out of super dense chakra. Like so heavy that Naruto's mini tailed beast bomb that he uses in his hand that's maybe one one thousandth of the size of a regular tailed beast bomb is referred to as heavy by Naruto. Mind you, Naruto could probably lift a mountain. So Minato teleporting a Susano really wouldn't be that much of an issue. And I know what you're saying, you're saying, Mick, you're forgetting Itachi's ability. I'm not. Because up next on our list of hypothetical jutsu combinations that would make you the most powerful person in Naruto, we have Itachi's moveset. 
most specifically the Sword of Totsuka and the Yada Mirror. If somebody sat down across from you and said, I'm going to write a character who has a shield that deflects any incoming projectile and a sword that if it scratches you, it will seal you in a Genjutsu realm forever, you would say, that's a stupid fan fiction. But the thing is, it's not. It's just Itachi. The combination of having the Yadamir and the Sword of Totsuka is hilariously broken. If Itachi was a regular dude who was able to use his Susano for even half as long as Sasuke or Madara was able to, it's hard to think of anybody that would have been able to give him a good run for his money. The Yadamir is a holy relic that's able to match the elemental release of any ninjutsu fired at it. It's also stated that it's able to reflect any attack physical or spiritual, which loosely implies that the Yadamira would also stop any incoming genjutsu attacks or if you want to take spiritual one step further it could also be referring to sage mode attacks and since genjutsu was yin release and physical attacks are yang release and then the five chakra elemental releases would be countered by the yada mirror and possibly senjutsu that means the shield reflects everything not that that would really be a problem because behind the shield is what's referred to as the greatest defensive jutsu in existence the Susano. And then once again, obviously, there's the fact that there's the Sword of Totsuka in play. And I know what you're saying. But yeah, Itachi Susano is slow. It would be hard for him to catch up to people because it only moves as fast as he can. That is, of course, you know, unless he got his full Susano, which has wings. So the hypothetical in this scenario isn't the combination of these two things because that's already happened. It's if they could have been as useful as they could have been. Did you think we were done talking about Itachi? We're not. Because coming up next is a slightly more toned down combination of Jutsu, Sukiyomi, and Demonic Illusion Toad Confrontation Chant. This combination is the Naruto equivalent of maxing out your intelligence. See, as we all know, Sukiyomi is one of Itachi's multiple Sharingan abilities. It's a time-altering Genjutsu that if you make eye contact with Itachi, he's able to place you under. So in essence, while fighting one of the strongest people in the Naruto universe, you can't look him in the eye. Because if you do, you get placed into a 72 hour long torture chamber that only takes one second in the real world. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, okay, well fine. I can just stare at his toes. Kishimoto wanted to draw him, so I might as well look at him. But unfortunately with this combination, that's not enough. You see, Demonic Illusion Toad Confrontation Chant is the only Genjutsu we see in Naruto that's based off your auditory senses. The majority of Genjutsu in Naruto are based on touch, smell, or sight. But with Demonic Illusion Toad Confrontation Chant, if you simply hear the song that Ma and Pa sing, you are placed in a Genjutsu. And here's the thing, it doesn't matter if you're Genjutsu resistant, this Genjutsu overrides any level of skill. This Genjutsu also doesn't have a number limit. If Mom Pa sang this into a loudspeaker that broadcasts all across Konoha, the entirety of Konoha would be caught in a Genjutsu. And there's only two ways out of this Genjutsu. If the caster of the Genjutsu undoes it, or if one of the Stone Toad Samurais drives their sword into your heart, killing you. With a combination of Tsukiyomi in this Genjutsu, you would effectively be able to make sure that your opponent wouldn't be able to hear or see while fighting you. And I don't know about you guys, but hearing and seeing seem kind of important in a fight. And the thing is, like with a lot of other hypotheticals on this list, this is something we could have seen. I mean, the toads of Mount Muobuko have a standing relationship with Konoha where the Uchiha's live. It just worked out that none of the toads ever trained a user of the Sharingan. But since we're talking about users of the Sharingan and Konoha, that brings us to our next entry on the list, Sage Mode and a Susano. Yes, I know, technically Madara had this, but I want to go further into depth on it. This, once again, is possibly something that could have happened if the Toads of Mount Muobuko weren't racist against the Uchiha's or vice versa. And it's genuinely a shame that Madara was the only person who ever really pulled this off, because the way that Sage Mode works combines perfectly with Susano. See, we all understand that Susano is incredibly taxing to the user. Sasuke states that it feels as though every single cell in your body is on fire fire and it requires using a massive amount of chakra i mean you're literally making a chakra avatar but sage mode if used properly can give you almost infinite chakra see the way that sage mode works in naruto is that you have to stay perfectly still to pull in nature chakra to mix with your own personal chakra to create senjutsu chakra see, naruto is able to accomplish this by having shadow clones sit perfectly still to make the senjutsu chakra and when they disappear it all comes back to him hashirama is able to accomplish this by using his wood release as hashirama creates the senjutsu chakra himself but uses his wood to move for him. You'll see when Hashirama is using his wood release that he's standing perfectly still on top of it. By making his wood release his arms and his legs, Hashirama is able to stand still and collect nature chakra. But there is no jutsu that is better for standing still and doing nothing 
then the Susano. Well, obviously, yes, the user of the Susano can launch attacks from inside of the Susano, like a Fireball or a Chidori or anything like that. By and large, usually a Susano user is standing completely still. So if hypothetically there was a Sage Mode user who had a Susano, they could not only basically infinitely sustain their Susano, they could also create their Susano with Senjutsu Chakra, which would not only make their Susano stronger as a whole, but would also make it a more viable opponent against things like True Seeker Orbs. And I think the fact that Madara had Sage Mode and Susano and an already existing insane Chakra pull is why he was able to use his Susano for so long in the Fourth Great Shinobi World War. But there's one addition to the Susano that would be even greater than Sage Mode. And that ironically would be Susano's greatest enemy for a long time, would release. See, we know from both Sasuke and Madara being able to put a Susano onto Kurama that you can put Susano on things that aren't yourself. I mean, obviously when we saw Majestic Attire Susano in the fourth great Shinobi World War, Sasuke was kind of inside of Kurama's little chakra form. So I guess he kind of was putting the Susano on himself. Madara put the Susano on Kurama and that was just regular old Kurama. So that proves it. And even if there is technically the caveat that you have to be touching whatever your Susano is attached to, you could argue that any user of wood release is attached to all of their wood at any given moment. So why would this combination of wood release and Susano be stronger than Susano in Sage Mode? I mean, yes, it would be significantly more chakra depletive considering the fact that Sage Mode is the battery for Susano. But fortunately, if you had the combination of these two jutsus, the length of the battle is not something you would ever have to worry about. Hashirama's wood golems, and this is without Hashirama being in Sage Mode already, have been shown to go toe to toe with Madara's Susano. A combination of Hashirama's Wood Golem and Wood Dragon have been shown to go toe to toe with Kurama. Hashirama's God Deity Gates were able to hold the Ten Tails down. Now I know considering Thousand Arm Kanon would be cheating considering the fact that it is a Senjutsu art. So that would be Sage Mode Susano and Wood Relief. But without a Susano attached to the Thousand Arm Kanon, it was able to punch a Susano off of Kurama while Madara was riding him. You add even just 10% more firepower to the Thousand Arm Kanon in the form of a Susano. And by the way, the amount of increase in firepower would be substantially more than that. And Madara would have been so dead, even Izanagi wouldn't have brought him back. But even if you don't want to count Thousand Arm Kanon, because it obviously does imply the use of Sage Mode, Hashirama hypothetically being able to make his own majestic attire wooden golems would have been disgustingly overpowered. And if we consider when Madara asked the Five Kage if he wanted his Shadow Clones to use Susano or not, that does imply that a practice user of Susano can have more than one Susano active at a time. Meaning, hypothetically, Hashirama could have multiple majestic attire wooden Susano clone things. Madara implied he could make five Susano, and Hashirama has more chakra than him. And once again, this could have been a possibility for Hashirama. I mean, Hashirama quite literally killed Madara. He could have just pulled out his Sharingan and thrown him into his face. Would the rest of the Uchihas probably not have liked it? Maybe. Would Hashirama ever do that to his lover? Absolutely not. But would it have been the best thing he could have done for Konoha by a long shot? Absolutely. He'd probably still be Hokage. And that's all I got. I could do a bunch more, but I got back from Japan yesterday and I am incredibly jet lagged. I am already seeing the hat man. Tell me if you guys had any combinations I didn't think of and what you thought of my combinations in the comments below and why you guys are down there. Please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I am legitimately delirious. I'm going to lay down.